Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel. I am Jimmy Smith. Pleasure to have you on board for our second part of the biodynamics in viticulture. So this is following on from part one, looking at the history and an introduction to biodynamic agriculture. So we're now going to talk about uh, the biodynamic vineyard. So we're still going to talk about biodynamics as agriculture, but then we'll move into specifically within the vineyard and how it uh, can be uh, used and benefiting the vineyard. And then plus we'll look at the uh, the farm sprays, the three major farm sprays. So this part does not include the, uh, the compost preparations or more of the cosmic side of it, that's coming later. But this is more about the farm sprays uh, and those kind of things. As ever, if you have any comments, questions or concerns, please do get in touch with us via the social media at the bottom of each slide or you can comment on the YouTube channel or drop us a line at Wine with Jimmy uh, on the um, contact page on the Wine with Jimmy website that's winewithjimmy.com okay so let's get into this really fascinating and interesting topic um, now as mentioned last week uh, we dove into the uh, the history uh, surrounding biodynamics and how organic was uh, sort of born from it and talked about Rudolf Steiner uh, and specifically around agriculture remember we are focusing on the role of biodynamics through agriculture and through viticulture we are well aware that there uh, links, of course, to the Anthroposophy Society that uh, Rudolf Steiner established um, way back when and the difficulties around talking about those. But we are applying the very much beneficial notion of biodynamics uh, in this and the practical side of it. Uh, so let's, uh, let's begin and uh, let's move on to talking a little bit about the vineyard a few issues around conventional farming and then how of course introduction of biodynamics and of course organics is in fact very beneficial to the landscape so let's have a look at that so our first thing we're going to mention here is just actually talking about the difference between viticulture and agriculture so both of these are of course the use of the land uh, for crop management and viticulture dealing within the production of uh, vines for grapes. Agriculture, of course, much more varied, but really when you come down to look at the use of the land as well on an annual basis, you'll see there are quite stark differences there as well. Uh, so one thing about viticulture is that predominantly, and as you can see in this picture, predominantly viticulture is about monoculture. So that means that there is only one usage coming out of that specific land. Uh, so that means that the land is not being fully used for its potential. Uh, and also there's a lot of um, steps taken to maintain that the viticulture is successful, which can eradicate many other um, things around biodiversity within the landscape. So viticulture is a very interesting one due to the fact that it is one use of the land. It is not polyculture, it is monoculture. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, agriculture, of course, can be just one crop as well, but uh, there's, there tends to be quite a lot of integrated management. But also about the fact that viticulture is um, really one plot of land which is annually used. It is used consistently uh, and the land really doesn't get a breather from the production. Whereas agriculture, there are many things around uh, farming to do with crop rotations, uh, where different types of crops are used within the same area of land to maintain more of a healthiness and a balance within that area, that locality. And it, this could be around, of course, uh, maintaining that certain crops will be more beneficial with nitrogen and, uh, and giving the right nutrients within a certain soil. And of course, in some crop rotations, rotations the land is left fallow for time as well to recover uh, and this doesn't tend to be so much of what you will find with viticulture of course uh, so with viticulture the soils will tend to become quite nutrient uh, deficient because of this uh, and then with all of the the general day-to-day -day use of that land with things like tractors you'll find that there is soil compacting so the soil becomes very firm and solid and this could lose uh, soil structure and also cause more issues with things like surface runoff and erosion of your soils. So certainly big differences between viticulture and agriculture, of course. Um, so just uh, sort of reiterating that really, the problems with monoculture 
Um, we've talked a little bit there about the issue of uh, compacting of the land, um, but the big thing here really with the viticultural monoculture is that there is a distinct lack of biodiversity within the landscape. Uh, and there are many risks that are uh, assist associated to that. The uh, system in place, your farm system, your vineyard, will actually lack in connectivity. And it's not able to rely on the adaptability of nature, which is wonderfully complex and fantastic. Um, but really, we have damaged that in this instance, and therefore it becomes very reliant on the human touch uh, by things like chemicals of mankind. So the biodiversity here is very much diminished, and when issues do arise, uh, there is very little adaption against it. Um, the importance of biodiversity, I think it's absolutely integral to the integrity of living systems. Um, so where we have things like forests uh, and, uh, you know, more um, wild land and wild bushland and scrubland, you will find a huge amount of biodiversity within there. And if there are any changes, be it small or large, often that area, that, that uh, forest, that woodland or bushland can adapt quite nicely. Um, and that's the trading mechanism between, between all the plants and the trees and even the animal and flora and fauna. And you'll find there is a trading mechanism of sugars and they can work with different organisms. They can trade carbon, nitrogen and many other minerals and nutrients. Um, really in these very diverse landscapes, thousands of species will work together uh, and really as a sign of unity and pulling together for the bigger picture, they provide a really resilient system uh, that can adapt to those seasonal changes uh, and those issues that may happen. And of course, we know that Mother Nature, in terms of weather and climate, is very much varied. So of course, therefore, these biodiverse systems can actually adapt uh, around that. So we think it's kind of like bringing in the forest mentality the biodiversity of a woodland or a forest into your vineyard to making it more resilient and more unified um, you're, you're drawing on nature to really help uh, protect against the issues that that one may face in a uh, in a vineyard um, other conventional issues are uh, around of uh, things like loss of soil structure, like I mentioned on one of the early slides, and we've got some pictures of it here where you'll see compacting, and then if there is heavy rainfall, you'll see issues around surface runoff, and then cracks start to appear in the soils, as you'll see quite dramatically here. You may be noticing this maybe where you live as we sort of enter into the world of climate change. Certainly where I live, um, and I've been here several years, there's been a distinct difference in the, um, the soils around where I walk my dogs. Uh, year by year, the soils tend to get more compacted. There seems to be um, more, of course, dry nature. Um, there's a uh, really kind of extreme. And the soils, you'll see these large cracks appearing much more frequently and more intensively. Um, so this is really due to the fact here in vineyards with the lack of cover crops, which we're gonna go into some great detail about as well. The lack of cover crops, the biodiversity means that you have a lack of healthy uh, humus, uh, and that compaction by tractors leads to that soil erosion. Uh, and there are studies by scientists at Padua University in Italy claiming that for every bottle of Prosecco produced, uh, about four and a half kilograms, that's around 10 pounds of soil is lost. That amounts to around 400,000 tons of soil each year. Uh, and the rate of soil erosion in that area is around 10 to 11 times more than the uh, Italian average, which is crazy. And you may have read in the news about things like mudslides and issues around the over farming of the landscape around Treviso in um, Veneto because of this massive demand for Prosecco and therefore a big demand within the vineyards as well. And I, I do believe in some instances, some of these mudslides have damaged property and in fact caused loss of life as well. Um, so that is quite um, quite an intensive thing as well. So the loss of soil structure. 
the next thing is around you know the ways that people combat around uh, this in monoculture and conventional farming and that is with things like soluble fertilizers so really these and it says it on on the uh, the front of that dr earth healthy land healthy cropped uh, it has the npk there of course this is nitrogen phosphorus and potassium and that is what we call the holy trinity in terms of agriculture very important um, the nitrogen is is remarkably important for leaf growth uh, the phosphorus is very important for uh, root development photosynthesis and respiration and potassium more for photosynthesis and then sap flow within the vine um, so many of these are ammonia urea based and uh, they believe uh, that this can impact the wine. Many biodynamic, real stout heart biodynamic viticulturalists believe that that kind of ammonia taste is something that you may be able to find in conventionally farmed wines. And Rudolf Steiner, the creator of biodynamics, actually believed that the wines produced, uh, sorry, a produce that came from this were lifeless. Um, often this has been linked really that the, the, the vineyard or the agricultural area, the farm, needs something quick. It needs quick nourishment. It's in a bit like fast food for the farm or for the vineyard. Uh, and the more of that you have, of course, the more unhealthy it really does get as it relies on those. So think of it a little bit like fast food for the vineyard. And then, of course, um, issues around glyphosate, which is uh, the big brand name here, Roundup and that is weed killer. Uh, so the commercial name Roundup, of course, it contains many other chem chemicals as well as glyphosate, and they are mixed together, and they are uh, sort of, when they're mixed together with these other ch chemicals, it's a thousand times more uh, toxic than just glyphosate on its own. Uh, and the other chem chemicals are things like arsenic, cobalt, lead, nickel, uh, chromium, it's quite a few things. Now, uh, big governmental bodies around the world have declared Roundup glyphosate fit for purpose. They have said it's safe. And certainly uh, big organizations like the European Food Safety Authority, the EFSA. Uh, but most of their research, you have to take this really cynically, most of their research is in an industry where you know, that research is funded by the big companies themselves. So uh, they haven't tested the various individual commercial formulations. Uh, and they say that these are safe for humans. However, um, there have been some tests, I'll get to those soon, that uh, the long-term effects can be quite, um, quite intensive with overexposure. Uh, and it's probable that this is a carcinogenic and it also probably affects the body's endocrine system, causing uh, issues to the liver and kidneys. Uh, industry testers dispute this, but uh, they've declined to reveal how they get to their results for their safety tests. So there's a bit of a gray area around all of this. So how does it affect actually life in the soil? And I think this is quite interesting. So you'll see, um, that uh, really the, the the most important part here that we're talking about is the soil health. OK, so your um, your humus, your earthworms, and then we're going to talk a little bit about manure and the right kinds of manure as well. So the quantity, uh, which is, of course, the volume as a topsoil plus the quality of that topsoil. So your humus determines the overall quality of that vineyard. It gives real good capability to hold um, nutrients, water, and gives good uh, stable soil structure, something we of course have talked about being a lack in conventional farming. Uh, and with healthy humus comes earthworms, uh, and those earthworms are the, those that with their, with their wonderful activity help release the phosphorus in the soil. Um, so your soluble fertilizers, I mentioned two slides ago, don't do that. Um, they don't take into action the forces in play. They are, of course, that junk food for the vineyard. Um, and that's very, <clears throat> excuse me, that's very much a big thing. 
Um, and also, there's also vineyard waste as well. Things like dead vines, prunings, grape skins and pips. Conventional farming tend to throw these out, burn them and, you know, uh, get rid of them, a bonfire and so on. But in fact, their storage of carbon is remarkably important. Uh, and the vineyard acts as that storage of carbon, important, of course, for combating climate change. Um, the best manure that we are uh, experiencing across the organic and biodynamic movements here is the cow manure due to its moisture. Um, but sheep is used as well. Uh, and that uh, tends to be less quality as it's a bit drier. And horse, which uh, horse manure is probably the closer to cow manure due to the fact that it has good heat again but some say too much um, now if we do aim to increase the health of our topsoils around the world there's a very famous man uh, who uh, who is a big sort of uh, agricultural expert he's called dr timaya and i've got him up on the next slide coming up in a second but he explained that if we have an increase of that top sports topsoil just by a few inches which increases the volume and then hopefully therefore the quality it can actually increase global food production by somewhere to 50 to 60 percent which is fascinating and that's actually been a study between four major agricultural uh, uh, organizations um, so let's talk about then um, those earthworms we know they're important here is Dr. Timaya, and he's done a number of earthworm tests. Uh, and we mentioned glyphosate, weed killer. We mentioned that it could have a detrimental effect to humans. We know that it has severe toxicity, although it's been um, confirmed as safe and fit for, for use. Recent research has showed that um, glyphosate does destroy microorganisms within healthy soil and it affects the earthworms as well. So Dr. Timaya, uh, who is pictured here, um, did a number of studies where he subjected earthworms to glyphosate, weed killer. Uh, and he noted that they um, immediately secreted um, this kind of sticky green liquid, which was a very um, intensive reaction. But within two hours, they were dead. The earthworms were dead, so therefore, um, dramatically affecting the, the biodiversity within that soil and the health of that soil. Um, if it is used, I mean, earthworms will tend to try to move away from that locality because, of course, it is toxic to them. So it pushes them away from that area, thus really reducing the natural healthiness of that soil. Um, and glyphosate does tend to stay in soils. It filters into drinking water and traces are being found in drinking water today across the world. You'll be able to search for that in your own time and have a look online at those issues. So let's talk a little bit about um, um, what biodynamic vineyard will look like or the farm will look like. So biodynamic agriculture, looking at a closed system, so a closed farm system is one where the farm is able to really deal with itself, to regenerate itself without needing to open the farm gate and um, draw from the outside world. It should really, therefore, be a self-sustaining organism, as you can see up there on that picture with some wonderful hogs and, uh, and some, I think, chickens in the background as well. So everything within the farm should be connected. And it's about understanding that connection. When you take something away, what can we replace it with? What it, within the environment will be a great substitute? What is connected to it? Uh, and uh, it, that will actually reduce the need for chemical sprays and anything brought from outside of the farm. And these things that are brought from outside of the farm are more expensive. The vineyard will become, or the farm will become much more reliant on them. You'll have to keep using more these manufactured synthetic things, fertilizers and, and fungicides and so on, and they will need to be purchased in greater detail, ending up spending more. Why not rely on Mother Nature and the connectivity of the farm environment if it is possible to some degree? Um, it may be you might be able to need to use something, of course. Uh, there's always a bit of a playoff uh, between um, sustainability and then more conventional approaches. Um, this also will ease pressure on landfills because of course you won't be sending too much more to landfill, you're using what's in within the farm environment. 
Um, but it is difficult. It is difficult to um, to really instigate this because it's very hard for a farm to become purely self-sustaining. But there's no harm in aiming towards this. Um, and difficult in areas like Europe, for instance, where there's less, less sort of agricultural space uh, and in viticulture due to the monoculture of the vineyards, which have you know one use taking up a big area of land so the closed system but one thing i wanted to mention as well is that yes you close the farm gate and you can regenerate as uh, a self-sustaining organism but always worth uh, as this uh, this this farmer is doing here leaning over the fence and sharing ideas and potentially trading things maybe you have an excess of cow manure and then another local vineyard will need that um, you know things like that if you do have those uh, those um, things available in your vineyard um, so that is very difficult and that's something which we, we we really do need to do and I think this is one of the hardest thing in a world that is becoming less um, connected in neighborhoods and there's more individuality this is difficult this is remarkably challenging um, but it's important it really is important to share ideas and to share um, uh, over produce uh, in these as well. Think about in Europe, maybe as a vineyard, you don't have access to the livestock to, to produce your manure. Um, sharing ideas and leaning over the fence and asking around if there's any excess is a way, of course, of, of restoring balance in that landscape. Um, so I think that is uh, mightily important. Next up is um, talking a little bit about pest management. Um, before we move on to things like cover cropping, which is interlinked with pest management. Now, of course, the conventional approach is often if there is an issue with a pest which is causing you, uh, you know, dismay and it's affecting your vineyard, uh, it's time to go to war on that pest and to eradicate it. Um, but using these aggressive pesticides uh, or acericides, as they're called, is very damaging. It will get rid of the pest, but it will get rid of everything around it. Their predators and the, of course, biodiversity uh, of the flora and fauna around there. Um, so, also, if you do attack these pests and you um, you remove that pest's habitat where it was residing in the ground vegetation, for instance, then it will just try and go elsewhere. Um, if it's not destroyed, which is often the case, it will move elsewhere, probably up into the vine canopy, where it then again becomes a problem and you'll have to try and treat it again. Um, conservative techniques. This is bringing into play things like um, biodiversity management and cover cropping. Um, that is a way of trying to promote naturally the sustainability. So if there is a problem of pest, then potentially the ecosystem can deal with it. So this is sort of a biological control uh, by producing a shelter and food sources for the predatory insects that will then, of course, hopefully feed upon those insects that are causing you issues. Um, so, of course, this is integrated pest management, but it is pivotal within the biodiversity of biodynamics. Cover cropping, something which is not exclusive, of course, to biodynamics, but it is definitely um, very important within it, but also within organics and sustainability. Um, cover cropping, or otherwise known as green manures, is where you are, of course, sowing other crops within your monoculture to create a polyculture. Um, these may be vegetables, flora and fla fauna, herbs, and so on. And you'll see some nice pictures here of plants and uh, lupins and uh, lots of different um, products. Now, this, of course, creates better biodiversity. So they aim to, first of all, bring nitrogen and carbon dioxide into the soil, absorbing it from the air, of course. Uh, and this will create a more stable humus uh, and then shielding the soil from erosion. If there's any intense rainfall at that time, of course, it's going to be more bound together and binded and protected against that rainfall. Uh, and then, of course, it brings a host of beneficial insects as well. The leguminous crops like peas, beans, vetch and lupins are great at really absorbing um, atmospheric nitrogen. Uh, and uh, this will be fantastic during winter uh, and stores that. Um, and then when you plough the landscape and mow the landscape, 
that is then of course drawn into the soil and absorbed into that soil very good way of getting that into your soils um, it's not just about growing cover crops all the time you know and letting them go wild it's about how much you grow them and really about understanding what they will give to the landscape, to the microclimate. Um, I had a very good chat with Florent Beaumard of Savinier, and he mentioned that, you know, understanding cover cropping is important because if there's drought-like conditions, it's quite important to cut the cover crops as they will take up too much water, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, you need to think quite proactively around your cover crop management. Let's give you a couple of examples to look at, um, which I think gives you some good sort of um, thought provoking uh, ideas. We've got two examples here, one on the left, one on the right. One is on a slope, steep slopes at the top of a slope, and then one is at the bottom near the river or a lake. So example one on the left hand side, top of the hill, you've got that vineyard there. That's the best I could do with some uh, clip art. <laughs> it looks relatively like a vineyard. It's very bright, great luminosity here at the top of a slope, but it's steep, very free draining. So the soil here, because of the amount of surface runoff and erosion, and really the lack of water in the soil because it is drained through it quickly, is a very high consumption soil. You're going to need to give it as much as possible. Um, instead of just applying shed loads of fertilizer, why don't you do a cover crop? That will stop erosion. So as it says here, the solution, sowing things like leguminous um, plants like peas and beans that have absorbed nitrogen out of the air, like we mentioned on the last slide, and into the soil. And this is also giving you a food source, right? You've got, uh, you've got peas and beans, which um, you can use as a crop. So it's um, a polyculture. Um, if you then spray with a, a biodynamic um, spray called BD500, which promotes a lot of, of soil health, and we're going to get to those in a second, that is very useful for this. So that's in that very high consumption, high steep slope part of uh, a vineyard. Example two on the right hand side here, you've got valley floor, flatter landscape, high availability of water due to its proximity to the river or water, a tab water table where water is going to be very available. Fertile, rich soils, very high vigor vines that grow very nicely and a lot of botrytis is possible due to the amount of water in the locality. A way for cover crop management here is to sow permanent cover crops such as herbs that will absorb the energy, evaporating water and nutrients, thus reducing vine vigor because it's combating the vines, but also reducing botrytis as it's storing that water. So less botrytis in the grapes. Um, so that is certainly a way of combating it. Very useful techniques of cover crop management across the board there. So um, before we sort of head to the sort of last parts of um, the presentation, we are looking at the three farm sprays. So there are nine um, main components to the preparations of biodynamics, and we are going to look at the farm sprays. So this is not the compost preparations that will be dealt with in a forthcoming, uh, forthcoming slide. So the um the sprays are bd 500 501 and 508 that is uh, cow horn manure that is horn silica that's that middle one and then you finally got horse tail they're your three farm sprays the picture at the bottom there is the very old school way of mixing this into water warm water uh, so you are applying these small amounts of uh, horn manure, silica, horsetail at different times of the year, and you are dynamizing it in a bucket or a barrel uh, for which then can be sprayed across your vineyard. We'll get to that in a second. So diamond, diamondizing is the way around uh, sort of integrating that into the water. Um, so the, uh, the, the three farm sprays are what we're going to look at. Um, this has not come up too well here, but there are six compost preparations. As I mentioned uh, last time, things like oak, yarrow, nettle, chamomile, valerian, and dandelion, they're all going to be talked about on the next part. Okay, so um, first of all, the first farm spray is BD500. This is the horn cow manure. 
Now, this is, of course, where we start to think a little bit more cosmically and integrating the thoughts of astrono astronomical thinking within our practical side of it. Remember, Rudolf Steiner, uh, despite his issues, he certainly was uh, influenced by Eastern thought and philosophy, so more around the cosmic side of things, and then West Western firm thinking of science. And that's bringing these two together. So there are some instances here that I will talk about a bit more of the um, the cosmic side of it uh, and the, uh, the the associated influences, which you may or may not believe in and you may think is pseudoscience, but um, I am going to mention them a little bit uh, in terms of the uh, these farm sprays. So the, um, the manure is uh, cow manure, which is from a certain type of cow, a female lactating cow, will be placed within a, cor uh, a horn, uh, and it's a cow horn. It will be buried for six months in winter, uh, and basically that's because the, um, the process is said to uh, really um, take on the earth sort of breathing in and breathing out and the earth is said to sort of you know breathe in during winter and protect itself and then breathe out of course depending where you are in the world and it's it wants to experience that so they bury it in winter as it's breathing in and then they will um and then and then dig that up in spring as it is breathing out so it's that kind of inhaling and exhaling effect of mother earth um and this is used to sort of stimulate the vine, this process, giving it more terroir, more biodiversity within the humus uh, and a richer top soil. Um, this will be sprayed in large droplets, uh, quite commonly after light rain, around two to four times per year. Um, normally when the earth is breathing in or out around autumn, or spring according to the biodynamic principles. Um, one of the horn's contents is about 60 to 120 grams, uh, and that will be uh, mixed into liquid stock, and that we talked about the dynamization of that earlier. That's around 30 to 120 liters, uh, and that will be applied to about a hectare in total, uh, but there will be variations on this. Um, it, can be mixed with the barrel compost from Maria Tun, who's very famous for the biodynamic calendar, of course, and bringing more, say, modern biodynamics to the fore. Um, but it will not be mixed with the horn silica or horse tail. And why the cow horn, you say? So the, this is where it gets a bit more sort of cosmic uh, and uh, astrological. And this is around um, the astral energy of the cow horn. Um, they have tried to use other things like um, animal hooves and earthenware pots to mimic this and bury this in the earth. Um, but the biggest protagonist against this was the very big biodynamic agricultural man, Nicolas Joly from the Loire Valley, Valley that said his studies uh, have seen that actually still using cow horns are 80% more successful than clay pots. Uh, and uh, you know, those studies, I'm not sure if they're publishable, but it's probably more anecdotal than anything. Um, the influence here of this um, uh, this preparation BD500 is on the lower part of the plant. It builds that soil structure, as we mentioned, the humus, uh, and, and attracts lots of earthworms, bacteria, and fungi as well. You get an energy and a vitality and, and a life in that soil and it stimulates bigger, deeper um, root growth normally, uh, and it helps regulate things like lime and nitrogen, which you may be um, sort of looking at in terms of cover cropping. Okay, so that's BD500. The next one is BD501. This is cow horn silica. Um, so this is buried for six months in summer. So this is the alternative time um, that this is used in comparison to BD500. This is seen more of a kind of a cosmic side, side of link, whereas BD500, the one before, is more about the soil and the roots and the earth and much more about the being. The 501 is much more about the link to the cosmos and that kind of uh, astrological side of things. So this is therefore the upper part of the plant, those that are 
uh, uh, getting the sun's energy, that cosmic energy. Uh, so this is around plants and leaves and shoots uh, and using this um, cow horn silica is a way of maximizing um, the use of light and heat. It improves photosynthesis. So silica, and I'm going to talk about what it is in a second, improves photosynthesis and it gives uh, better plant absorption and assimilation of carbon dioxide. It encourages more light and summer processes to strengthen the plant against things like fungal attacks. Uh, and it, it is said to be beneficial for ripening and raising better sugar in both the sap and the grape. And it allows for um, uh, often a slightly longer harvest, which is possible as well. So this will be finely sprayed uh, after it's of course dug up after summer, finely sprayed uh, around at the top of the vines it will be dynamized of course in water around two to four times per year normally before flowering because that's when the vine is springing up into action and connecting to the energy of the sun and then after it is complete when the earth is breeding out around the harvest time of course um, but it's really i think the best two times for it is just before harvest and just before flowering um, it's a fraction of the of the horns contents around two to six grams only which is mixed into about 30 to 300 liters of water and that will be applied to about one hectares of uh, vines for instance um, you can mix this with horsetail and I'll um I'll, we'll look at that next and also it cannot be mixed with the first spray bd 500 so it's about the silica okay that's the key thing here and uh, silica Quartz is very important. It makes up nearly 50% of the Earth's crust minerals. Uh, it's present in humans, in animal, in our eyes, our skin, our nerves, as well as our well-being. So silica, therefore, is very human important in animals and plant, therefore, cosmically important as well. So um, quartz, as I mentioned, very important. Um, it's in soils, uh, it's on beaches, sand, you know, you'll find it, it within things like granite and other rocks giving that sparkle. Uh, and that sparkle, that kind of lovely sparkle that the soil can have, obviously it's clear that silica has a relationship with heat and light due to that reflect, reflecting refracting sorry of light so think of um, an example here about uh, a hot beach sand for instance it can feel underfoot at, at, at midday it can be very very hot and then how cool it is as soon as the sun sets and this was a great analogy that I took I think from Monty Walden uh, and his book about biodynamics uh, so just think about that you know you could be walking on the beach when the sun is setting and it's still quite warm but as soon as it goes down it becomes quite cold uh, almost instantaneously and that's due to the relationship uh, we think of quartz and silica uh, within sand um, and without silica our eyes wouldn't function There'll be no glass or lenses for optics uh, and so on. So mightily important, of course. And then our last farm spray is the BD-508 horsetail, as you can see in the picture. So common horsetail has 70% silica. So this is why this can be mixed with BD-501. And it's a plant that has one of the highest concentrations of silica within it in the plant kingdom here on Earth. Combined with sulfur, it is indeed very antifungal. So that silica content and sulfur content that you'll gain from other elements with the preparations that we'll look at next time will, in fact, counteract those issues with fungal effects. It counteracts the excess moon influence in the soil, and that is what can encourage fungal diseases. So it's very much a counterbalance against that. So this can be sprayed on the soil or onto the plant when oncoming wet weather is due. Of course, this is basically the biodynamic way of spraying things like sulfur, um, direct sulfur onto vines to combat against things like mildews. So this is normally around the new and full moons uh, of each month. Um, it's needed, you know, it's sprayed as needed, uh, but normally will be used during spring and summer when you, of course, have got warmer and potentially sometimes wetter weather, which can onset things like mildew. Um, about 100 grams of it will be diluted into water and that will affect around one hectare in total. And an example here 
here we go. So um, <clears throat> the it has been sort of taught that um, moon forces, and I've got a picture here, a little diagram, there's a moon in the top right here. Uh, the moon forces become excessive in wet ground. The connection of the moon with, of course, tides and water on Earth. So if you have wet ground, um, you will find that uh, there will be a connection with the moon. Excessive moon force, or therefore lack of sun, means that plants will have less energy uh, to ripen and form seeds. Uh, and in effect, the plant pretty much comes to soil and the upper part of the plant becomes a haven for soil organis organisms like fungi, for instance. So the fungus, which is found across the soil, then is transmitted into the grapes and the leaves. And you have problem with fungal molds like mildew, for instance. Um, but horsetail, when this is being sprayed, the BD508, will in fact reduce the soil's water capacity. Um, and uh, it will absorb the excess lunar influence and uh, pushing basically the fungal spores back into the ground where they belong. And you will tend to see uh, less of an effect of mildew into your vines, for instance. OK, so that is your BD 508. So that brings us to the end. So this is 40 odd minutes. Now, this has been a pretty big section, but fascinating nonetheless. And once again, there are practical appliances here. They are quite successful. They're not always successful. Um, and of course, there are more uh, mainstream versions of these in, in, in instances like biodynamics, which are used. But I still think it's important to talk about them because there is an increasing movement of biodynamics in viticulture. Uh, and it seems to definitely have a place in our future. And we've talked today more about the practical side of it with some smaller influences of the cosmic side as well. The cosmic stuff we've talked about today certainly is a bit more of the practical and less of the far-fetched side of it. I will mention some more about those in the next one, but we will talk about those next in the six compost, prep compost preparations and a little bit about the cosmos. I'm no astro astrologer or astronomist. I, I I am definitely not uh, going to be the greatest in explaining it, but I will do my best. But so thank you so much for your time and attention. Please do come and see us if you're ever in London for a glass, a class or a bottle. It'd be great to see you. Any comments or questions, please get in touch. But until next time, see you again soon. Goodbye.